Ever wonder what it'd be like to be hunted by a relentless cyborg assassin from the future? That's the terrifying reality for Sarah Connor in the iconic sci-fi action film, The Terminator. I'm a Terminator. This 1984 movie launched Arnold Schwarzenegger's career and spawned a multi-billion dollar franchise. But The Terminator is more than just shootouts and explosions. It's a thrilling story of love, destiny, and a desperate fight for survival. Sarah Connor, an ordinary woman, becomes the target of a cyborg sent back in time to eliminate her because her unborn son holds the key to defeating a powerful artificial intelligence called Skynet. Kyle Reese, a soldier from the future, is also sent back to protect Sarah, and he falls in love with her and becomes the father of her child. Before James Cameron helmed sci-fi classics, he cut his teeth in a variety of areas of film production. Early on, he dabbled in costume and special effects design, working on films such as Battle Beyond the Stars and Escape from New York. The turning point for Cameron, however, came with a rather controversial project, Piranha 2 The Spawning. Originally hired for design work, he found himself thrust into the director's chair after the original director, Miller Drake, was fired. Ironically, Cameron himself had previously been fired from the project by producer Ovidio Asanaris for failing to capture a certain shot. This experience, though chaotic, proved pivotal. It ignited Cameron's passion for directing and gave him a taste of the challenges and rewards that come with the role. While working on the low-budget Piranha 2, James Cameron wasn't just battling filmmaking challenges. During a scorching summer in Rome in 1981, he developed a high fever that led to a vivid dream. In this feverish state, a terrifying image emerged. An implacable, metallic monster rising from the flames. This unforgettable nightmare would become the seed of a revolutionary screenplay, The Terminator, that would change cinema forever such films as The Terminator. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to James Cameron. Early in his career, James Cameron, then an unknown director, struggled to get major studio support for his unique script. However, the script's potential was undeniable and it attracted considerable interest. In 1982, Cameron made a bold move. He sold the rights to producer Gail Ann Hurd for a symbolic $1, but with the crucial stipulation that he would direct the film. While this decision allowed the project to move forward, he would later come to regret it. He famously remarked, if I had a time machine, I'd send a message back just saying, don't sell Terminator. Where the hell did you do that? Cameron's vision of the year 2029 is a desolate one. Los Angeles, a once gleaming metropolis, lies in ruins ravaged by a war with the machines. Humanity clings to survival, hunted by ruthless cyborg killers. Through brief but powerful flash forwards, Cameron paints a chilling portrait of a dystopian future. Society has collapsed. We see people huddled in makeshift underground shelters, desperately struggling to survive on dwindling resources. The movie's bleak atmosphere is inspired by real life horrors. Cameron incorporates elements reminiscent of footage documenting the Warsaw Ghetto during the Nazi occupation of Poland in World War II. He masterfully recontextualizes these tragic events and places them in a chilling scenario of future warfare with artificial intelligence. The vision of the Terminator went through some major revisions before it hit the big screen. Originally, his script featured a time-traveling team-up, two cyborgs going back in time to face off against two human soldiers. A Terminator, as in the final movie, was envisioned as a hulking metal endoskeleton. But alongside it, Cameron conceived of a second Terminator made entirely of liquid metal. This innovative concept proved too ambitious for the special effects technology of the time. Budget constraints also played a role, so Cameron shelved the idea only to revisit it triumphantly in the 1991 sequel, where the liquid metal T-1000 became a pop culture icon. Kyle Reese wasn't always a lone wolf. Cameron's original plan called for him to have a fellow soldier. Unfortunately, that companion met a brutal fate. He met his demise upon arrival in 1984 by materializing right into a wire fence. By streamlining the cast, Cameron created a tighter, more dynamic narrative. Focusing on the central struggle between Sarah Connor, Kyle Reese, and the singular Terminator allowed for deeper character development and a more intense relationship between the protagonists. When the script arrived at Orion Pictures, the studio made a few changes. First, they suggested adding a cyborg dog as Kyle Reese's companion. Cameron found this idea ridiculous and rejected it outright. Orion's second request was for a more developed relationship between Reese and Sarah Connor. This suggestion resonated with Cameron, who saw the potential for a compelling love story. Incorporating this feedback ultimately led to the movie's heartwarming romantic arc between the two characters. 
James Cameron's reputation as a tough director was cemented on this set. Throughout his career, he's earned the nickname Iron Jim for his uncompromising vision and relentless pursuit of perfection. That intensity hasn't always been easy for his actors. Linda Hamilton, who played Sarah Connor, described him as a taskmaster who could be very difficult to work with. Michael Bean, who portrayed Kyle Reese, echoed this sentiment, saying that Cameron knows everyone's job better than they do and often delivered superior results himself. The crew wasn't spared Cameron's demanding nature either. The now famous, you can't scare me, I work for James Cameron, t-shirts speak volumes about the production environment. The Terminator is a sci-fi action classic, and Arnold Schwarzenegger's portrayal of the cyborg assassin is unforgettable. But what if I told you that Arnold almost wasn't the Terminator? James Cameron originally envisioned the Terminator as a very different character. He wanted a nameless, nondescript figure who could disappear into a crowd. Actors like Lance Henriksen, O.J. Simpson, Sylvester Stallone, and even Michael Douglas and Kevin Kline were considered. Interestingly, Mel Gibson and Tom Selleck passed on the role altogether. When Arnold Schwarzenegger first saw the script, he was actually attracted to the role of Kyle Reese, Sarah Connor's protector. However, after meeting with Cameron, they both realized that Arnold's imposing physique was a perfect fit for the Terminator. Here's a fun fact. Despite his iconic status in the film, Schwarzenegger only had 14 lines in the entire movie, just two more than his dialogue in Conan the Barbarian. This detail highlights Cameron's masterful use of Schwarzenegger's physical presence and stoic expression to create such a chilling and memorable villain. Many actresses were considered for the role of Sarah as well. Sarah Connor, the seemingly ordinary 19-year-old waitress thrust into a fight for survival, became a pop culture icon. But the casting process behind Linda Hamilton's iconic performance is a story in itself. The role was originally offered to Deborah Winger, known for her dramatic turns in An Officer and a Gentleman and Terms of Endearment. Winger, however, feared that a low-budget sci-fi action movie would tarnish her reputation and ultimately passed on the role. The choice then came down to Linda Hamilton and Jennifer Jason Lee, both actresses who would go on to success. But in this case, fate or perhaps James Cameron's vision, intervened. And it was Hamilton who landed the role and forever etched her name in movie history. Landing the role of Kyle Reese, Sarah Connor's protector and future love interest, almost went awry for Michael Bean. Believe it or not, the filmmakers initially considered Sting the frontman of the police. During his audition, Bin unknowingly spoke with a southern accent, a leftover from his earlier audition for a Broadway role in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. While James Cameron liked Bean's acting, the accent didn't fit the character of Kyle Reese. Fortunately, Bean's agent assured Cameron they could easily address the accent, paving the way for Bin to secure the iconic role. The Terminator's visual style owes a surprising debt to 1940s film noir. Cameron, seeking a dark and suspenseful atmosphere, drew inspiration from this classic genre. To achieve this vision, he enlisted the talents of cinematographer Adam Greenberg, a veteran with two decades of experience creating the signature look of noir films like those directed by Sam Fuller. Greenberg's expertise proved instrumental. By primarily shooting at night, they leveraged the darkness to create deep shadows, stark contrasts in lighting, and a pervasive sense of unease. I was aiming for a cold image, Greenberg explained. Lots of dark shadows, strong backlighting, very strong, hard contrast. Remember the iconic scene in the tech noir nightclub where the cyborg assassin first encounters Sarah Connor, only to be thwarted by Kyle Reese? The club's name wasn't a random choice. Can you tell me where you are? I'm in this bar called Tech Noir. Yeah. Director deliberately evoked the classic noir genre, known for its dark, gritty settings and morally ambiguous characters. Cameron's brilliance lay in seamlessly blending these noir elements with futuristic technology. This unique style became the foundation for tech noir, a subgenre that explores dystopian futures where oppressive systems are challenged by lone heroes. Total Recall, Twelve Monkeys, and Brazil, the hallmarks of tech noir, a bleak future, suffocating control, and a maverick fighting against the machine. I'll be back. Yeah. In the scene where the Terminator enters the police station, the script originally called for him to say, I will be back. This more formal phrasing might have felt out of place for a cyborg assassin. Director James Cameron recognized this and changed it to the now iconic, I'll be back. This change wasn't met with immediate approval. Arnold Schwarzenegger, known for his strong, on-screen presence, reportedly argued that the Terminator wouldn't speak in contractions. A brief but memorable disagreement ensued, with Cameron ultimately asserting his creative control. Well, what does the f 
script tape. <laughs> <laughs> As in when a script says, I'll be back, and he says, then say it. The shorter, punchier, I'll be back has become synonymous with both the Terminator and Schwarzenegger himself, solidifying its place in pop culture history. Surely the Terminator wouldn't be the same without its iconic score? That driving, pulsating rhythm became a hallmark of the franchise. The man behind it? Brad Fiedel, a former keyboardist for the soft rock duo Hall & Oates. Fidel took a unique approach. The score itself is a study in contrasts. Metallic percussion evokes the Terminator's robotic heart, while melancholic melodies represent the human element under threat. For the scene where the Terminator enters the police station, Fidel composed music that fit seamlessly with the rest of the score. However, James Cameron had a different vision. No, he said, I don't want the audience to think about anything other than that moment. Fiedel, unaccustomed to such a directive, recalled, I had never worked with a director on this level before. Cameron's bold choice stripped away the music, leaving the raw tension of the scene to take center stage. In Hollywood, securing the right talent can make or break a film. Orion Pictures initially hesitated to greenlight the project. Their condition? James Cameron had to hire a renowned makeup artist, Dick Smith, known for his chilling work on The Godfather, The Exorcist, Taxi Driver, and Amadeus. However, after reading the script, Smith himself recommended a different artist for this job, Stan Winston. Winston, whose career began in the 1970s but skyrocketed after his groundbreaking effects on 1982's The Thing, was instantly captivated by Cameron's Terminator script. He took on the responsibility of makeup, practical effects, and crafting the endoskeleton based on the director's sketches. Winston later called The Terminator the biggest breakthrough of his career. The film's climax, featuring Reese destroying the truck with the Terminator at the wheel, is an unforgettable explosion. To achieve this effect realistically, the actual truck was rigged with 42 explosives. However, for a truly spectacular impact, special effects supervisor Gene Warren created an impressive 8-foot scale model of the truck. This model was used for the most dramatic explosion sequences. Interestingly, James Cameron originally envisioned blowing up a full-size tanker truck for the finale. However, safety concerns at the police armory filming location nixed this idea, despite pressure from executive producer John Daly for a more traditionally triumphant ending. Both producer Gail Ann Hurd and Cameron fiercely defended their creative vision. As Cameron recounted in an interview, I just looked at him and said, the movie isn't finished yet, it's not over. Yes, you got that right. The studio wanted to end the movie with that exact scene. By the way, the thrilling car chases in the film weren't just due to the stunt driver's skills. Cameron employed a clever technique. Most scenes were filmed at regular speed and then sped up in post-production. To further heighten the illusion of velocity, additional cars with rotating headlights were positioned alongside the main vehicles during filming. As these cars passed external light sources, the effect created a blurred image, enhancing the perception of breakneck speed. As the result, the Terminator defied expectations. Made for $6.4 million, it became a box office goldmine, grossing a staggering $78.3 million worldwide. Reviews for the Terminator were mixed. The Los Angeles Times praised it as a rip-roaring thriller packed with action effects and humor. However, not everyone was a fan. Bill O'Connor of the Akron Beacon Journal called Arnold Schwarzenegger's performance wooden, and Ed Blank of the Pittsburgh Press deemed the film artistically ugly. Despite the initial split, the Terminator's reputation has only grown. Empire Magazine placed it among the 500 greatest films ever made, commending its ability to deliver thrills with the same relentlessness as its cyborg protagonist. With great success often comes controversy. The Terminator franchise wasn't immune to lawsuits. Two science fiction writers claimed James Cameron borrowed heavily from their work. In the early 2000s, Sophia Stewart, author of the 1981 novel The Third Eye, which features a machine uprising in a dystopian future, filed suit against both The Terminator and The Matrix. These lawsuits were ultimately unsuccessful. Harlan Ellison, a renowned sci-fi author, alleged Cameron lifted elements from two of his 1964 TV episodes for The Outer Limits. Soldier involved time travel from a future ravaged by war, while the demon with a glass hand explored protecting a future savior. Cameron reportedly wanted to fight the claims, but Orion Pictures opted for a settlement to avoid negative publicity. This included a $65,000 payment to Ellison and a credit in the film's end credits, with gratitude to the work of Harlan Ellison. Despite the settlement, Cameron has been vocal in his dismissal of Ellison's claims, calling him a parasite.
James wasn't just the genius mastermind behind the Terminator, he also made a sneaky on-screen appearance. There's a rumor that Cameron himself voices the man who cancels his date with Sarah Connor on her answering machine at the beginning of the film. This cameo remains unconfirmed, but one thing is for sure, Cameron definitely portrays the motel manager who checks in Sarah and Kyle Reese. Speaking of hidden appearances, the body bag used for Kyle Reese at the end of the movie, that wasn't just any prop, it was actually a part of James Cameron's own costume. The Terminator's 1984 release was a massive success, and James Cameron eagerly returned to direct the sequel. With a staggering budget of $94 million, T2 became the most expensive film ever made at the time. Cameron meticulously managed these funds, ensuring every penny translated to stunning visuals on screen. In fact, rumors suggest the opening scene alone cost more than the entire first movie. And, well, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. If you liked the episode, which I really hope you did, feel free to share the link with your friends, subscribe to the channel, and click on the buttons below the player. And see you in the next issue. Okay, let's move on to the next location.